it's my pleasure to uh, interview Michael and um, welcome him to Santa Cruz. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's very good to be here. There is a lot happening. I mean, I think we are building a food movement, and I think we see it in these alternative, uh, this alternative food economy that's rising all around us. I mean, you're all part of it. Um, when you go to the farmer's market, when you join a CSA, um, and, uh, and so these very interesting structures are being created, and people are voting with their forks for a different kind of food system. Um, but voting with your votes is really different. I think there's no good reason to eat this stuff right now. Um, and that's why they're fighting so hard uh, to make it impossible for you to choose. Because there's no benefit to the consumer. I mean, if these crops offer anything to anybody, it's, it's a certain measure of convenience to farmers and an unprecedented amount of control to seed breeders. Um, but to consumers, they're no cheaper, they're no more delicious, they're no more nutritious. Um, all they offer is this unquantifiable potential risk. So if you do your risk-benefit analysis, as you should as a consumer, you would think, well, why would I eat this? The rational decision is, I think I'll wait and see what, they, you know, what happens. Um, and, that's, and that's why this, you know, they don't want you to have this choice. So, I didn't mean, to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speechify, but I feel strongly about this. <laughs> well, we want to hear your, 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 your uh, I, I've thought about this, and I see their ads, and I see their propaganda, and uh, their efforts to control the food supply. I mean, Monsanto and a few others control about 50% of the seed supply right now. And, yeah, two and, companies, Monsanto and DuPont, I yeah, think it is. Yeah. yeah. If their goal was to uh, reduce world hunger, as they will claim, there are certain properties that they would be seeking to engineer into the seeds that they are they're modifying. Enhanced nutrient profiles, ability to tolerate drought, uh, ability to grow on substandard soils, alkaline soils, acid soils, um, in, increased antioxidant properties. There's certain kinds of things you'd see. Ability to, to um, to, to thrive without expensive inputs. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, there it's the are. Opposite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, not what they're, that's not what they're giving us. And, and in fact, as a result of Roundup Ready crops, which is the primary one, we are seeing an avalanche of Roundup used, and to the point now that it's becoming, weeds are becoming resistant. Um, and we're starting to see 2,4-D. Um, it seems to be a vicious circle. Um, cycle that's taking us down a dark place. Well, it's the old it's the old pattern. In a way, there's nothing new about these crops, right? It's just the pesticide treadmill with a, with a couple new tricks, right? I mean, you 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 engineer a trade into these crops so that it allows you to spray a lot of herbicide on them, and then when that herbicide fails, which it's failing, then you move to another more toxic one. Um, so the idea that this was going to be a different paradigm, as as Monsanto promised, or more sustainable. Uh, so far, it hasn't been true. It's led to more pesticide use. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, I think that it, the, the mystery of the industry is that after, what, 18 years, that they haven't come up with anything better than Roundup and BT. Roundup is the, is the herbicide resistance. BT is, the, is uh, the, the plants that produce their own insecticide. And I did some reporting on Monsanto. I wrote a piece about uh, genetic engineering in, in 1998 for the Times. And I, had this, I got this amazing access to Monsanto. Up to that point, I was a, a garden writer, and that's how I approached them. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, I'm a, I write about gardens for the New York Times, and I'd really, you know, I think this is the next wrinkle in our relationship to plants, and I'd love to grow some of your, your GMO crops. I've actually grown GM potatoes in my farm, so. It's not, I guess it's not organic. Um, and, uh, and just to see what it's all about. And, you know, garden writers are the most benign people on the planet. So, Except so, one. Uh, so they let me in. And, and I had this amazing access. And I got to uh, meet every executive and all their scientists. And I went to the, I helped the woman who takes the freshly uh, genetically uh, inserted plants and, you know, puts them in their 
little petri dishes and takes them from there and puts them into soil. And, and, uh, and then I went to visit all their, the farms that are buying their stuff. And it was a wonderful experience. And when they, but I said, so are you worried about resistance and BT and Roundup? And they said, oh, these are just the first generation. Within five years, here's what we're going to have. We're going to have plants that can fix their own nitrogen and drought tolerant and climate change resistant and, and <laughs> high yield and all this wonderful stuff and nutritionally enhanced. But for some reason, it hasn't come. <laughs> and no, but I think that that's telling. I think that there's actually some problem there that if you think about what the understanding of genetics was in 1998, it's very different than it is today. And you go back to 98, and everybody thought that every gene uh, led to the expression of uh, the, the creation of a protein, which was a single trait. So you had this linear pro pro uh, process. Gene, protein, trait, one for one. And then, they, then we had the Human Genome Project. And something kind of amazing happened, which is we counted how many genes we have. And to our astonishment, there were only 25,000 genes. We expected to find hundreds of thousands of genes. And it was, it was like a scandal. I and mean, when you think about it, I mean, we're such complicated characters. But we had fewer genes than, like, rice. And <laughs> <laughs> way to go, rice. Um, I think we're, like, up there with the roundworm. Uh, <laughs> So then people try to figure out how could you produce all this wondrous complexity, you know, the human brain, consciousness, with 25,000 genes. And they began to realize, oh, it's not just the genes. It's, and, and also, it's not a, a linear one-to-one -one process. It's a very elaborately networked process. So one gene can actually make several different things happen depending on where it is and what uh, regulator genes, which in those days were called junk DNA which was our arrogance. We didn't know what 95% of the genome did, so we said, ah, it's junk. <laughs> but it turns out to be very, very important. And then we learned about epigenetics, the fact that the environment does affect genes and, and leads to changes that can be inherited. That's, that's an astonishing idea. So my point is the whole technology may be based on a false understanding of how the genome works. And it may be that Monsanto, at this moment, is struggling with that and hasn't figured out how to do anything complicated and wonderful yet. They can just do these one gene, uh, or two gene, or three gene things. I don't know. I, I think we're going to learn that there's a, there's a problem at the very heart of the technology. And that's why they're stuck with these two products that essentially offer consumers nothing and, uh, except doubt. And, uh, you know, so that, I think that's how they find themselves vulnerable to labeling as a giant threat to their business model. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be, you know, I mean, it's weird. They do brag about GM on the editorial pages right. in the op-ed. You know, uh, it's going to feed the world, as you were saying. It's going to it's going to uh, solve climate change and double productivity of agriculture. So they're happy to talk to the elites about this, but they're not happy to talk to consumers. And I think the reason is that they don't have anything to to offer the consumer. So in this case, to me, um, ignorance is not bliss. It's subordination. Yeah. And that's what the fight is about. Yeah. The fight is about <laughs> The fight is about challenging this, this control of our food supply. Right now, um, the only way you can be sure not to get GMOs is to buy organic food. Um, and which, which brings to my mind, there was a study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine a month or so ago that came out of Stanford, although it doesn't represent Stanford as a whole. It's being called, inaccurately, the Stanford Organic Study. And it, it, it seemed to, the, the way the press is talking about it, uh, it's, it seemed to find that organic food isn't worth any, any extra money, that there's no advantages to it health-wise. Um, and yet, the study did find uh, much greater pesticide residues in conventionally grown food than organic. It, no surprise there. It did study also found that uh, organic meats had far less antibiotic resistant bacteria than uh, conventionally produced meats. Um, but this, th there's been this assumption, somehow the press has taken it to mean there's no advantage to organic food. And it's a waste of money, and it's an elitist thing, and it's just basically a, a con job. 
And, and when I see that happening, I hurt because I know that's not true. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, here's a case where I, I, I will dump on the press. Um, I think that, uh, I think the press did a really sloppy job in covering this study uh, and overplayed it, uh, the New York Times in particular, the paper I write for. Um, the study had all sorts of problems, um, but the, the big one is, I think, that it erected a straw man, uh, and that straw man was that the reason to buy organic is because they're, that the food is more nutritious. Not healthier, more nutritious. Which is to say higher levels of, of, of nutrients, of, of minerals and antioxidants and all this kind of stuff. And it looked at all the research on that question. Well, actually not all the research on that question. They left out some very important studies for reasons that were never really explained. Um, and concluded that there were differences, but by the, in the judgment of the authors of the study, they were not significant. Um, now, this is not a new study. This is what's called a meta-analysis. It looked at 250 other studies uh, and crunched the data. And, you know, there was another meta-analysis done a year, just a year before, based on the same studies that had concluded that the differences were significant. Um, so there's some judgment in that. But the main point is, that is not the reason people buy organic. Um, they buy organic, well, there, there are several reasons they buy organic, but a more important one is lower levels of pesticide residues. Um, and there are, other, there are other reasons, too, that are, I think are just as important or more important, which is environmental. I mean, to keep these pesticides out of the environment, to keep... <laughs> to support farmers who are not uh, subjecting their farm workers to pesticides. I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole range of, of reasons, keeping the water clean and, um, and the soil healthier. And um, so it was, it was a kind of phony thing that just fix on this one thing. Now, even in this one area, there actually is some intriguing but not definitive research that a food grown in healthy organic soils does have higher nutrient levels, which is interesting. Um, but is it significant? No, most of us are getting plenty of nutrients. You know, we're not suffering from, I mean, we're over, we, you know, we're overfed in this country. We're not, we're, there's not a lot of nutrient deficiencies. So it, I don't think that's the, the best reason. Um, so anyway, the, the, the story got hyped. I think part of the reason is that in the, in the elite media, um, the, the critique of industrial food has gotten plenty of play. It is, the media has really been on our side, for the most part. Um, and I, I, I know this from writing for the New York Times, where, you know, I've written on lots of other topic, topics, but when I wrote about food, I never had to give equal time to the other side, uh, you know, and I could say whatever I thought and offer my own conclusions and say you should buy grass-fed beef and organic is better. And, and um, because these editors in New York didn't realize there's anyone who disagrees with that point of view. <laughs> and so, so there was, I, I felt like I had a free ride for a long time. And then about two years ago, maybe three years ago, the industry decided they had to fight back. And, in, and, and since then, they have organized a very well-funded PR campaign that sometimes you've, you've seen some evidence of. There's something called the food dialogues that are being presented in various places to really talk about how food's produced and, and greater transparency. Um, uh, and I found this. I've, my, I, I've been able to get my students into like slaughterhouses and things like that that would never have happened a few years ago. And they're lobbying newspapers and editorial boards saying you've got to give equal time. And you see all these kind of anti locavore pieces and anti, you know, pro-GM pieces on the op-ed page um, everywhere. So I think they have kind of spooked the newspapers into realizing they need to give equal time on this issue. And, it's, and it is an issue with two sides. Um, so I think that that's part of And so when they have something like the Stanford study that's critical of organic, they're, they, they're happy to play it up, just so they can then say to the Farm Bureau or whoever is talking to them, see, we are covering the, the other side. So I think yeah. that that's what's going on, and that's why the, the movement is getting a somewhat less friendly press than they were. 
But even the Times ended up writing a piece about the methodology of that study, which is as close to a retraction as, as they would be willing to go. <laughs> When you uh, just now referred to us at, as a society as overfed, um, I'm, I'm thinking about these rising obesity rates and kids and adults and all the, the diseases that come from that and healthcare costs. And, I, and I'm, I'm also thinking about the fact that there are in the world today about a billion people suffering from diseases caused by inadequate food. They don't have enough to eat. And so they don't have enough, any of the nutrients, actually, including calories. And then we have another billion or so people, many of them in this country, suffering from illnesses of over, over consumption. Too many calories, too much fat, too much everything, basically. Too much food. And, and, and this, there's this kind of almost macabre mirror image there. A billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about a human tragedy of epic proportions. Mm -hmm. And it's the same food system that's producing both outcomes. Uh, yes. I mean, in many ways. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, which is this globalized food system based on a handful of grains, um, you know, corn and rice and soy and uh, wheat. And, um, uh, and, you know, Raj Patel wrote a wonderful book called mm -hmm. Stuffed and Starved mm -hmm. uh, about this, um, that it is all one complex. And, you know, industrial agriculture is incredibly productive and is producing uh, something like 3,000 calories for every person on the planet, and we don't need that many, um, but it is not distributing them in a way that makes uh, nutritional sense, ecological sense, uh, you know, sense in terms of equity. Um, so a whole lot of those calories are wasted. A whole lot of those calories are fed to cars, and 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 then a giant percentage of those calories are fed to animals to produce meat. Um, so there's, you know, there, there are enough calories be being produced to feed everybody if we, if we rationalize the system and didn't have the, the, the kind of um, organization of, of food that we have. On the other hand, th that, that same system is, is, is also taking these handful of crops, corn and soy in particular, yeah. and turning it into not just meat, um, but into junk food. I mean, you know, we're subsidizing the building blocks of, of, of fast food. Um, and you know all these, uh, all the refined oils, the sweeteners, the high fructose corn syrup, and um, uh, so, and that's you know we know is contributing to obesity. I mean the way we're we're producing food. So, it's you know these monocultures of, of grains and commodity crops um, leave some people very hungry. And even in countries that have had great success growing lots of grain now, such as India. Um, the, 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 the benefits of that grain do not extend to Indians. I mean, there are, you know, even in years of starvation in India, the, the silos were full and overflowing uh, because people didn't have the money to command the food. Um, and subsistence agriculture had been broken down, so people didn't have food in the field that they could eat um, because they'd moved into these chemically intensive monocultures. So it's a, you know, it's a deeply dysfunctional system at the moment. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, a big part of what the food movement is trying to do and, and, and researchers are trying to do. And, and, you know, there are other ways to do it. And, um, uh, and that, I think, is what we're, we're building or trying to build. Yeah, I, one of the things I appreciate about your work very much is the, that you see that the food on our plates is an environmental reality, it's a political reality, it's a cultural reality, it's a social reality, it's, it's, it touches all these dimensions of our lives. And, and the current as you, chemical monoculture system is, is just impairing the diversity. It, it's it's to, in some ways destroying the diversity that is the resilience of life. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I were talking about the, the uh, um, heirloom tomatoes, mm -hmm. and there's so the, the varieties of them, and how delicious and unusual and interesting they, and intriguing they are, and whether we're going to see a resurgence of heirlooms and alternative varieties and in other other areas besides tomatoes. And well, we're going to need resilience. Um, you know, we're going to need as much crop diversity as possible because the climate is changing, and um, growing what we're growing, where we're growing it in the next 20 or 30 years is, is, is not going to work anymore. So we need to, to place a lot of different bets 
not one big bet on you know these narrow. I mean, all the corn we grow in America is based on just a couple strains. I mean, a couple. Um, you know, the, the genetic diversity is so small, um, and it's gotten smaller with genetic engineering because they just focus on those. You know those really successful um, cultivars. Um, but we're going to have to try a lot of different things. And, and, and you know, there is, there is resilience in diversity. Um, and so the effort to keep alive that biodiversity, which is happening in farms and gardens uh, you know, all over the world, um, and depends on people being able to save seed, uh, yes. which, of course, is yes. a practice that is on its way out. Um, and <laughs> got a seed saver up there. Um, this is going to be really important. There's yeah. a lot at yes. stake in, yeah. uh, in preserving biodiversity. And we contribute to that, of course, with our food choices. You know, when we, were don't, when we only bought delicious apples, yeah. that was the only apple that was out there. And, and now we have an explosion of diversity in apples, which is a very healthy thing. Um, and we need to do the same thing in, in all our crops. Because if we diversify our diets, farmers plant different things, and, and not to mention there, um, Stanford might disagree, but there's a lot of health benefits in, uh, in diversifying your diet. <laughs> yes. uh, what percentage of, of the corn crop right now is, is genetically engineered? 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent. And how much of that is BT corn? That's, oh, that's, All well, of it? I think it's most of it. There's some Roundup yeah. corn, too, yeah. but BT corn is the big product. This is corn that, that puts out a, uh, a, a a very, you know, a fairly benign uh, pesticide is one that's used in organic production, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, it's a soil bacteria that produces a toxin that poisons uh, a certain class of insects. The corn borer and the cotton weevil. And, right. but, the, but it produces it in every cell of the plant. Yeah, that's the problem. It, it's, it's not targeted, so it's in the food, too. And, yes. and the potatoes I grew were BT potatoes, uh -huh. and every spud was exuding the BT, which has not been in the human diet before. And, and the, the weird thing was, and I looked at this when I was writing this piece, like, well, OK, you're saying that the FDA just declared in 92 uh, that, uh, organ uh, that genetically modified food was substantially equivalent to the food it was replacing, and, uh, which they did over the objections of their own scientists. Um, but how, and I, and I asked the guy, at the, uh, David Atchison, the guy at the FDA who was supervising, I said, well, there is something new here. There's, there's a new protein here, and how come this hasn't been treated as a food additive and been subject to the extensive testing that food additives get? And he says, oh, that's an easy one. It's a pesticide. I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, the FDA, we're not allowed to regulate pesticides. That's the EPA's job. So, so to the FDA, the presence of this new pesticide in the food supply was invisible. It was legally invisible. So, so then I went to the EPA and I said, so what about this uh, pesticide? And um, uh, why, you know, uh, have you tested it? He says, oh, yeah, it's, a, it, you know, it's much better than the other pesticides, so we're not that worried about it. I said, great. And then I looked, though, that the BT I had in my, in my garden shed, which I used because I was growing potatoes, um, had this extensive warning label of all the things that like, you should be concerned about in BT. And it was this standard boilerplate stuff. And, and so I went back to the guy at the EPA and says, how come you don't have um, a warning label on the food that, that's including the pesticide? When you buy the pesticide in the garden center, it has a warning label. He says, oh, that one's easy. We, um, only the FDA can label food. <laughs> <laughs> so they've kind of like... They've just kind of threaded the needle in terms of regulation. It's kind of brilliant. Um, yes. <laughs> brilliant in a macabre kind yeah, of way. Yeah. They, they, they also, uh, in, in labeling it uh, or considering it as substantially equivalent, that phrase, they, they decided that it was um, su sufficiently similar to not require pre-market testing, but sufficiently different but as to be patented, patented. That's right. yes, exactly. That's the beautiful double standard. Yes, this stuff is so new and radical that we can patent it, and you can't do anything about it. You can't save your seeds and everything. Yeah, that's what they're saying on one on one side of their mouth, and on the other is like same old, same old. Don't worry, just eat it. And uh, yeah, they do want to have it. But let's get off GA genetic modification. <laughs> All right, I have trouble with two part questions because I only can remember one part. Um, <laughs> I'll take the farm bill. 
If you're willing to lock the doors, because you can lose people when you're talking about the farm bill. <laughs> well, we don't have a farm bill now. It was kind of an amazing thing. The farm bill is, is, the, is the piece of legislation that every five years sets the rules for the, for the whole food system. It has an enormous impact over uh, the kind of food that's available to us and, and its price. And, um, and they started a farm bill conversation over the summer, I think in full knowledge that it would never pass. Because in an election year, it's very hard to move a farm bill, especially with the Tea Party, you know, controlling the purse strings in the House. So for some reason, though, they started pushing. And, and, um, and it's always a big fight anyway. And I, and I think the reason that they started the process was simply to shake down the lobbyists and get some money for their campaigns. I, 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 that's the only <laughs> conceivable, I know it's a little cynical, but that as soon as you start moving a farm bill, ConAgra, Monsanto, you know, Cargill, they all come forward and they write checks to make sure they get what they need in the farm bill. And, uh, and everyone knew it was going to be an expensive campaign. So, but the farm bill has the subsidies in it. It also has food stamps in it or SNAP payments. It's got nutrition programs and commodity programs. And that fact that those two very different things are in the same piece of legislation is kind of what guarantees that it's going to be crap, you know, year after year after year. Because um, the people concerned about hunger and, and making sure the poor have enough to eat cannot challenge the, the big farmers and the food processors who care about the subsidies or the crop insurance. So they're in this kind of unholy alliance, and they, and they hide behind each other's skirts, depending on who's unpopular at the time. And if the rights, you know, wants to go after um, uh, food stamps, uh, they're defended by Cargill and the Farm Bureau. Um, and, and if it's a liberal moment and there's an attack on subsidies, the hunger lobby actually will defend um, the big food company. So that's the kind of thing we're stuck with right now. Um, there's a current, subsidies though have become so demonized um, in, in the public. Um, and they, they seem so hard to justify. This is essentially paying farmers, um, you know, to the tune of 20 to 25 billion dollars a year um, to grow uh, commodity crops, corn, wheat, soy, cotton, and rice, um, either by the bushel or more often direct payments that, that you get because your land is corn land and is registered as corn land. So whatever you do with it, we're sending you a check, don't worry. Um, this became very hard to justify in an era of high deficits. So the industry, and it's important to understand that, that farmers, that, that's, that crop subsidies are more for the people who buy the agricultural commodities than it is for the farmers themselves, because they want to be assured of a cheap supply of these commodities. Coca-Cola has a very strong interest in crop subsidies. It keeps down the price of corn. Um, so anyway, so they've moved away from subsidies in this last farm bill that they negotiated over the summer that is not going to become law, to, some, to crop insurance, to expanding crop insurance. Uh, and they guarantee now, um, uh, and the government subsidizes this crop insurance heavily, that you will make as much profit this year within a certain percent as you did last year. No matter what you do, no matter where you plant, and you want to, you know, you want to put bananas in Montana? We'll guarantee it, you know, <laughs> um, which is a really kind of perverse set of incentives that we're creating, and I think potentially will cost even more, because the reason everybody wants to move to crop insurance is these are very high crop prices right now, and you'll lock those in, eight dollar a bushel corn or whatever it is. Um, so, I think a disaster was averted by not having this farm bill, but we could get a worse one. But anyway, the Farm Bill is, is, is an issue to pay attention to. It's very obscure, um, and I've simplified it, you know, grossly. Um, but it's where we need to drive change eventually. Can we do it now? I don't think so. We don't have enough allies on the agriculture committees. It's dominated by farm state um, legislators who are just trying to maximize these subsidies. We need to get urban legislators on this committee. Because we need people to understand that this is not a farm bill, it's a food bill. And that eaters need to be represented along with big farmers and, and, and food processors. <laughs> so it's, it's something to ask your congressperson. Why aren't you on the Ag Committee? 
Um, you know, we need to get, I mean, there are Californians on the Ag Committee, and, and they generally push toward more support for actual food, specialty crops, although their, their role is not as, as sunny as you might think. Um, did you know that if you are uh, receiving subsidies for growing corn and soy and, and the other commodity crops, you're prohibited from growing tomatoes or sweet corn or vegetables? And you get fined. I know a farmer in Indiana who was a corn and soybean farmer, very conventional, and some local packer said, you know, we really want to have some local Indiana tomatoes. Will you grow 10 acres of tomatoes for me? And he, and he put in 10 acres of tomatoes. And he was fined $42,000 by the USDA because the California delegation insists that as a condition of accepting subsidies for the Midwest, that those Midwestern farmers never compete with our tomatoes. So we have, to, we have to give that one up, um, I think. I mean, I, there's an effort among, Midwestern farmers want to diversify. Some of them want to diversify, and we're preventing it. So now you can unlock the doors. <laughs> um, there's also the, uh, uh, much of the money in, in the farm bill goes to the SNAP program, which yeah. used to be called food stamps, a great, great high percentage of it. And um, that money cannot be used to buy liquor or, or uh, tobacco. But there's no restrictions on what food stuffs can be purchased. And there is a movement amongst people, some states, some considerations to restrict, can't buy soda pop, can't buy junk food, can't, can't. buy foods that we know are, are, are causing people to, to be sick. Um, and yet, of course, the Confectioners Association and the junk food lobbies are fighting it tooth and nail. Do you think there's any chance that we'll see movement there? Well, Mayor Bloomberg in New York tried uh, on a trial basis to, no, not just his soda cup thing, but the, uh, uh, he tried to uh, do an experiment and if food stamps uh, could not be used for soda um, and do a trial and see if it had an impact on consumption of soda and obesity and diabetes, and the USDA wouldn't let him do it. Um, that's the power of the soda industry. Yeah. yeah. So I'm getting a signal. Yeah. We have time for just one more question, and you had your hand up. But it's important to realize that these fights take a long time. And if you go back and look at the fight to curb tobacco, um, it took 50 years. Um, so, you know, we, we have to understand the food movement is very young. Um, it, it's, you know, it hasn't had its Earth Day yet. It hasn't had its burning rivers in Cleveland yet. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, and it's growing, and it's growing really quickly. Um, but, um, it's up against the most powerful industry in the country. Um, there was a, a, a law passed in the last farm bill to really challenge the four big meat packers. There are only four companies when you're talking about meat. And they, and they uh, pack 85% of the, of the beef uh, in this country. And um, they really victimize ranchers. Uh, they decide who they're going to buy from, and if you make trouble, I met a rancher uh, two weeks ago who came to my class who was uh, challenging the big four, and, uh, and one day, nobody bought his meat anymore. Um, they just cut him out. They got together and said, well, we're going to kill this guy. And, um, and so uh, something was passed in the farm bill to make that kind of practice uh, illegal. And the Obama administration held um, uh, hearings all over the country, Department of Justice, USDA, uh, the gypsum laws. And they're, they're laws. And they haven't done anything. Um, so the reason that you get into this situation where with big money you can defeat the popular will is because you have monopoly. That's where that money comes from. And, um, and, and so I couldn't agree more with Jim that that's what we need to pay attention to. And the reason that nothing is happening, goes back to a decision made in the Reagan administration, which was that combinations of uh, companies were OK if it didn't harm the consumer. So in other words, as long as prices were low, and beef prices are low, meat prices are low, there's no grounds for action. Now, that's not why we have antitrust laws. They go back to the beginning of the country. In fact, Jefferson wanted a 12th Amendment to the Constitution that would have banned monopoly. <laughs> um, they understood how important it was because, the, you know, at the, in those days there was a monopoly, the East India Company, and that, that was a huge problem in the world. 
Um, but anyways, um, no, the, the reason we're, we have laws against monopoly is for concentrations of political power that are a threat to the government, that are a threat to all of us. And that's what we find. Um, and now we've given these monopolies uh, personhood and, and, and free speech rights. And now that's, you know, to, to allow monopoly and then give free speech to monopoly, it's a very dangerous combination. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, for your attention and your presence and your uh, being. And, and your good commitment. questions. And your good questions. I want to thank the panel for your... Go forth and make waves.